Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so for this, the final piece of the final session of the day, we have Sanjay Ramgulam, who's talking about Gaussianity and typicality in matrix distributional semantics. Thanks very much. Thanks to the organizers uh, for doing such a great job putting together this online conference. This talk is about Gaussianity and typicality in matrix distributional semantics. It's based on three papers with collaborators Dimitri Kotsaklis, Manush Sadrazadeh, and Louis Sword. So in the paper, Linguistic Matrix Theory from 1703, we introduced a program for applying matrix theory with permutation symmetry to describe the characteristics of randomness in some linguistic matrix data. This data comes from compositional distributional semantics, which associates uh, matrices to certain classes of words using algorithms in natural language processing. Random matrix theory originates from Wigner and Dyson, who used it to study the statistics of Hamiltonians uh, or of nuclear energy levels, and it has also found applications in many different areas since. So we used matrix theory techniques to study the statistics of the matrices that arise in compositional distributional semantics. The theoretical calculations are similar to Euclidean quantum field theory, and this exploits the idea that statistics is, uh, from a path integral point of view, uh, zero-dimensional quantum field theory. The 1703 paper used a simple solvable five-parameter Gaussian model with permutation symmetry and compared that to data. And then the 1809 paper solved the general 13-parameter Gaussian model. And in the 1912 paper, we applied that model to predict the properties of the data and found strong evidence for Gaussianity. So, Gaussians occur widely in nature. One parameter Gaussians, for example, describe the distribution of heights of men uh, or women. So if you plot heights along the horizontal axis, draw a histogram for the distributions of frequencies of these heights in uh, men, you'll get a histogram which is very nicely uh, approximated by a normal curve. So this normal curve is a function of x, where x is the height in that previous example. And there is a mean, mu, and a standard deviation, sigma. And this function, as a function of x, it's exponential. There is a quadratic in x here, and there's a linear term in x, and the whole thing depends on mu and sigma. With such a distribution f, you can calculate expectation values of x and x square, and these are simple functions of mu and sigma. So x is equal to mu and x squared is directly related to mu square and sigma square. And with that distribution, you can also calculate uh, x to the n, higher order moments. And again, these are functions of mu and sigma. But these mu and sigma are simply determined by these expectation values of x and x square. So when you're trying to test Gaussianity for some data set, what you can do is uh, take expectation value of x and x square from the experiment, from averages, determine mu and sigma, and then determine the model from the model, predict the higher order moments, and then go compare these higher order expectation values uh, to the experimental averages again. And if the data is really Gaussian, then you'll get very good agreement between these higher order moments and the moments calculated from experiment. So the idea in this talk is to look at some theoretical models of multivariable Gaussian matrix statistics. The variables are matrices, uh, and they're not independent. There's going to be some complicated interaction between these different variables. But these interactions are controlled by permutation symmetry. And because of the Gaussianity, it is still true that the higher order moments are determined by the linear and quadratic moments. And this is the key to the predictivity of the models. So I'll start by talking about how vectors and matrices and tensors are associated to words in computational linguistics. I will give some motivations for permutation symmetry. I will talk about the five-parameter model from 1703 and some tests of that model. 
And then I'll briefly explain the representation theoretic approach to the general 13 parameter model, and then describe the comparison to data where we find very good evidence for approximate Gaussianity, and we're able to quantify the small deviations from Gaussianity as well. So in distributional semantics, uh, the fundamental idea is that the meaning of a word is captured by the contexts in which it occurs. And one constructs vectors for words from the frequencies with which these words occur in the vicinity of a specified set of context words using a collection of text or corpus. So for example, if you have a book and uh, pick some context words such as pet and feed, you can compare, you can construct vectors for words such as dog, cat, or baby. And for each such word, you can look at the co-occurrence frequency of that word with pet, the word with feed, and these co-occurrences are basically how many times in the text does W appear with, within a five word window of pet. So for each word, you have a pair of numbers and these form a vector. And you want to represent the meaning of that word using this vector or extract the meaning by doing some calculations with this vector. In uh, compositional distributional semantics originating around 2010, the basic idea is that now we generalize uh, the association between vectors and words to something more general. And nouns are going to be vectors, adjectives and intransitive verbs are going to be matrices, transitive verbs are going to be three index tenses, and so on. And grammatical composition is represented by the action of a matrix on a vector and more generally tensorial operations. So for example, if you have an adjective, it acts on a noun to give a noun phrase. That's a grammatical transformation of the noun into a noun phrase. For example, black uh, takes dog, dog and gives you black dog. Uh, this is represented by a matrix for black, a vector for dog, uh, and the linear action of the matrix on the vector produces black dog. So these are some of the basic fundamental ideas here. And the outcome of that in applying appropriate techniques of linear regression and so on from natural language processing is that we have, and in, in this is what, that what we studied in the 1703 paper, we had a collection of around 300 adjectives, each associated with a matrix uh, of size D, where D ranges between 300 and 2000. So the question is, what is the statistics of this collection of matrices? What is the nature of the randomness? Is there Gaussianity or is there some other kind of distribution at play? What are the symmetries controlling uh, this, uh, these matrices? So random matrix theory provides a natural set of ideas to approach these questions. Uh, the simplest random matrix theories involve a Hermitian matrix, e to the minus trace m square, uh, in the original applications, the Hermitian matrix was viewed as something that models the Hamiltonian of a complex nucleus. And the statistics of energy levels of complex nuclei were found uh, to be actually rather well approximated by this very simple matrix model. This matrix model is invariant under UD, unitary symmetry, where M goes to UM, U trans, U dagger, and this leaves trace M square invariant. So in the context of the linguistic application, again, like UN here, we might think of some natural uh, continuous symmetries. So often when one has the uh, vectors for two words, let's call these vectors P and Q, one looks at the inner product, for example, and that's uh, you know, the, end, the dot product. Uh, and uh, that is a quantity which is invariant under orthogonal transformations. If P transforms from P to AP, Q to AQ with A, A transpose is one, so A is an orthogonal matrix, this quantity is invariant. So we're extracting from the data something which is OD invariant. Uh, but this is not always the case. Different kinds of measures people use are often not invariant in this continuous symmetry. And more frequent symmetry that you, you see more universally is the symmetry of permutations, which cor corresponds to reordering the context words, which surely shouldn't affect the meaning you're extracting. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a quantity such as Kullback-Leibler divergence for two vectors, which is sometimes used in NLP, 
Uh, this is a quantity which is not OD invariant, but if you transform PI to P of sigma I, where sigma I is a permutation, and at the same time, if Q goes to Q of sigma I, this quantity is SD invariant. So SD is a more natural symmetry to think about. Great. So we have matrix theory and we have SD or permutation symmetry. And we want to be looking at some matrix models. And these ma matrix models are defined by some simple Euclidean measure on the matrices, along with e to the minus s, where s is some action. Because it's Gaussian, s is going to be linear. These are two linear terms in M's, uh, which are also permutation invariant. In fact, these are the most the two most general permutation invariant linear functions. And then here there's a selection of three quadratic functions. And for each of these functions, there's a coefficient. So we have a simple five parameter model, uh, which we can use to study the, st the statistics of uh, the matrices. And uh, this is a, you could view it as a zero dimensional quantum field theory. It's like a path integral except zero dimensions. You can calculate expectation values of any function of M, particularly you're interested in functions of M, which are invariant under the action of permutations here. So the first step is to focus on the linear and quadratic expectation values. Two linear, three quadratic. You calculate them as a function of these parameters, these lambda, a, b, and so on. Uh, you get that from the theory. And on the other hand, you calculate the same expectation values from the experiment. That means you calculate averages over words of these functions of the word matrix. You compare these and calculate as a result uh, all the parameters of the model. Now you can uh, put that back in the theory and calculate for higher order observables, the theoretical expectation values, and likewise the experimental for each of them, higher order observables, the experimental expectation value, which is simply take that function of M, evaluate it on uh, the matrix for a word, sum over the words, divide by the number of words, that's the average. So you compare the theory with the experiment for some of them, like the sum of a diagonal elements cubed, you find some ratios near 60%. So the experiment and theory are off by around 40%. Okay, not a bad start for the model. So, okay, but for some of the other observables you find for this one, for example, the ratios are much worse. You have something like 0 0.013. So experiment and uh, theory are rather far away. Now, so first uh, thought about this is that well, have we really considered the most general Gaussian model, which is compatible with the symmetry at hand? Well, we haven't because we just chose three quadratic functions in that action. What is the most general quadratic thing that we could have put? There's a very nice answer to this coming from graph theory. Uh, you can associate these invariant functions with graphs where the M's correspond to the edges, the indices correspond to nodes. So sum of I, M, I, I square is I is this, this is M, this is M. Uh, if you have two nodes, you have two indices, M, I, J square. If you have three indices, I, J, K, you have three nodes. And again, everything has, everything has two edges because it's quadratic. So you enumerate all the quadratic invariants. And these are everything we should be thinking about in a Gaussian permutation invariant action. So you have 11 uh, the, of these quadratic uh, invariants. For each of them, you would have a coefficient. And you would need that along with the linear terms uh, to define the general permutation invariant Gaussian model. So this is a 13 parameter model. The way to solve this is to make maximal use of the symmetry at hand, which is SD, permutation symmetry. Uh, and the important thing is to recognize that these MIJ uh, variables, so the linear span of MIJs is a vector space of dimension D square. And it's related to something simpler, BD. So it's related to something which is a d-dimensional vector space spanned by d vectors E1 up to ED, where permutations act by taking EI to E of sigma I. And given such a representation, you can form the tensor product where sigma acts diagonally across the two. And that's exactly the action we're interested in on the matrices. So MIJ act, uh, transform in this tensor product representation. So what is this VD? From a representation theory point of view, it is a reducible representation. It has a one-dimensional invariant subspace and a D minus one dimensional, another invariant subspace, which are irreducible kind of building blocks of this reducible representation. 
And the VD tensor VD representation is also reducible and it contains four different irreducible representations, V0, VH, V2, and V3. And these are some multiplicities. This V0 appears twice, VH appears three times in that tensor product decomposition. So you can use this understanding of the space of matrices to kind of find some nice variables. They are called S variables here. So the span of these matrix variables is VD tensor VD, which is this direct sum here. There are four different kinds of representations. And for each kind of representation, there is one of these S variables. So V0, VH, V2. There are two copies of V0, so there are two copies of S. Three copies of VH, so there are three variables S. And uh, essentially, there's a linear transformation that goes from the MIJs to these S variables. And conversely, you can write the S variables in terms of the Ms. So taking advantage of these S variables, uh, you can write the general Gaussian model, which is quadratic in these variables. And the nice thing about isolating these different irreducible representations is that group theory tells you that the quadratic invariance will only couple V0 to V0, VH to VH, V2 to V2, V3 to V3. And because of these multiplicities two and three, uh, there are uh, some, uh, the coupling constants for this V0 representation involves a two by two matrix and a three by three matrix. So we have simplified the problem into something involving two numbers and a two by two matrix and a three by three matrix. And there are these two linear terms as before. So using techniques of Euclidean quantum field theory, one can solve uh, uh, expectation values. And uh, again, we calculate first the linear and quadratic expectation values. There are some function of the functions of the parameters mu and lambda that appear in that action. Uh, I've written one quadratic expectation value here. You would have 10 others because there are 11 of them, and all of these are expressed in terms of these mu's, lambdas, and d's. Um, and you compare these expectation values with experiment, and you can determine these parameters mu and lambdas. And you get some results. So these are, these are the results for D equals 2000, when the matrix size is 2000 by 2000. 13 parameters, you get some values. And then you can take these values, uh, feed them back into the theory, and look at the expectation values of cubic and quartic observables. And again, you get some functions of D, the size of the matrix. In this case, it will be 2000. And then these lambda and mu parameters. So you get some answers from the theory. And then for the same observables, you can do the experimental average, which is simply the average over the words. And uh, here I have just shown you uh, a selection of cubic and quartic observables that we looked at. It's a fairly sort of representative selection in the sense that uh, they range from having one node up to uh, five or six different nodes. Uh, and uh, we looked at these uh, observables. And uh, for each observable, you can calculate the expectation value, the theoretical one, and the experimental one. So these are only the cubic and quartic here. The linear and quadratic are fitted to agree. That's how we set up the parameters of the theoretical model. Now, for this cubic and quartic, we compare. Okay. And what we find is that for this uh, sum over diagonal elements cubed, we get 0.57. This was exactly the value that we got with the five-parameter model. This is another observable where with the five parameter model, we got a ratio of 0 0.013. So the ratio was tiny. Our theory was very far from experiment. Here, it's a, it's a significant improvement. But also quite strikingly, there's a whole bunch of observables here where the ratio is between 95 to 99%. Uh, so, so basically, the theory and experimental values are very, very close to each other. The theoretical is a very good prediction of what these experimental expectation values are going to be. And in, in order to do this theoretical uh, prediction, all that you have used is the expectation values of the linear and quadratic, of which we had 13. So summary, uh, the general permutation invariant matrix model work very well for predicting the expectation values of higher order observables using as input the linear and quadratic observables. and uh, 
further applications to compositional distributional semantics motivate the study of generalizations of this S2 invariant, SD invariant matrix model. Uh, you can think about two matrix Gaussians uh, that should describe the joint statistics of adjectives and intransitive verbs. You can look at Gaussians for three index tensors as opposed to matrices. These should be describing the statistics of transitive verbs. So uh, our studies uh, of the one matrix case are, set, are suggesting that these permutation invariant Gaussian models capture some properties of the randomness or noise in language. And it is reasonable to ask, using a signal processing analogy, if this can be used to pick up the signals now, now that you understand the randomness, can you pick up the signals? And, and that means the semantics. So can we therefore use this understanding uh, to apply, uh, you know, to devise new ways to uh, address uh, NLP tasks? And maybe one final comment is uh, that, you know, these Gaussian models are just some mathematical objects that take in a bunch of linear and quadratic expectation values uh, made from matrices and predict higher order expectation values. And so whenever you have matrix data, you could explore whether these uh, predict your statistics or not. Uh, so I will stop here. OK, let's uh, thank the speaker in the Slack. I'm adding my, my clap right now. There we go go and I guess everyone's a little bit a little bit behind us yeah here they here they come um, I'll maybe give people a m moment to uh, to see if somebody I can tell if someone starts yep somebody has started typing so let's give them a chance to oh no it's just a clap um, okay so so I have a question um, it's about these uh, these graph observables um, that you can compute from your model. Um, do any of these have already some kind of statistical meaning or something, or are they just purely used to kind of measure how good your model is doing against your statistics? So, so the uh, graphs are simply used. Uh, well, they are they are used to kind of classify the observables. You have, you have a question, you know, what are the permutation invariant polynomial functions of matrices? Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, if you had unitary invariants, you just take trace of M or trace of powers of M and so on. So that analogous question for permutation invariants, uh, you can ask, you know, what are the invariants? And there's one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between these invariants and graphs. So it just tells you the most general observable you should be looking at. Uh, and then, given that observable, you can calculate its average either from experiment or from the theoretical model. And then you're looking at comparisons between them. So there's no statistics as such uh, just in that first step. It's just classifying the observables. Mm -hmm. And if there's yeah, still nobody from the Slack, I guess I had one more. So is there any... Um... Is there any kind of reasonable kind of invariance to consider between uh, this kind of unitary invariance, which makes sense physically, and this permutation invariance, which seems very, I guess, very minimal? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in some in some ways, sometimes depending on what questions you're asking, for large D S D representation theory has in some ways some similarities to U D depending on what kind of questions you, you're asking. So at large D, and which is sort of the regime we are thinking about, these very large matrices, uh, SD is a, very, I mean, is a big symmetry as well. Uh, is there something in between? I guess it is a bit of a jump, you know, from a uh, continuous symmetry to a discrete symmetry. Uh, and I guess the point here is that uh, there are interesting discrete systems where it's not obvious why you would have a continuous symmetry. You know, these are vector spaces of words. You know, one direction for every word in a in a corpus or some selection of words in a corpus. There's no physical reason why you would want, in that case, continuous rotations as a symmetry of that problem. Uh, and and indeed, there are indications that permutation symmetry is more natural. So, um, for, for for a bunch of applications, I would say SD symmetry is natural. 
uh, I mean, in fact, there are also papers where people uh, have thought about sort of discrete versions of quantum mechanics, where instead of having UD, you would replace it by SD or something related. There was a paper by Tom Banks recently. So, so people have explored uh, this kind of idea of replacing UN with SN and trying to see whether you can recover the physics uh, uh, in the large N limit in some way. Um, so. Okay, interesting. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see you at the, at the next session. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.